together for Pastor with Wavy One Child. Give it up for Senior Pastor Mavuno. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pastor Thomas and Cheryl. And I just want to set the record straight like I tend to after you guys have been up here. But I'm not running or interested in any political office uh, in this city or in this nation. Uh, that's not my calling. And so if uh, anybody wants to give their votes, there's some governor-to-be people here in this place. And so let's, let, we're raising some fearless influences here, and that's their calling. My calling is to be a shepherd of God's people and to raise up those governors. And so we give thanks to God for that. By the way, next week we're going to be praying for everyone from here who's running for a parliamentary or governor or, or ward or whatever position. Uh, so if you are, please uh, let us know. Tell us at the info desk. Uh, give us your phone number. We want to make sure you're here, and we're going to spend some time praying for you. We're trusting God that this year you're going to occupy and that you're going to step up into the place God has called you to, uh, to be an influencer. Amen? Wow, this is a great time to be alive. I'm really excited to be alive at this point. So many great things happening uh, in our nation, in our own history, and like the two just said, I mean, it's amazing how we are so close uh, to finally getting, uh, to finally occupying uh, this land that God has given us. I just feel that we're setting, we're, we're making history here. And I look forward to seeing us in a home where we can influence our city and our children can be influenced uh, because of what we're doing and our giving. So I, I really thank God. Next week, we're going to actually uh, have our gift Sunday, like they said. Uh, but one of the things we're going to do, we're not going to make a big deal of it. Uh, just come ready to give your gift, whatever it is that you've pledged. And we're just trusting God that in the process, uh, he will help us to occupy. For our visitors, we're trusting God. There's a piece of land that we've been uh, purchasing for the first time. Avuna will be in our own piece of land. And we're this close. We're this close to actually occupying that. So we're looking forward to it, and we're trusting God that this is our year to occupy, occupy. How many people are occupying so far? How many people are occupying so far? You know, it's interesting. My wife, I'll just say this. This is not what I was planning to say, but my wife shared with me, and she said last year when we talked about thriving, because that's a word God gave us as a church, she said, you know what? I looked, and I said, Pastor, <laughs> she didn't call me Pastor Am, <laughs> of course, but she said, dude, that's what she calls me, son. Yeah, you, this thing, I don't even, I mean, it, it's great you're doing it for the church, but you know what? Somehow, theologically, I just don't get it. And she said, you know, I didn't buy in. Not because I didn't believe, but I just didn't buy in personally into the Thrive thing. And she said, it's amazing. I saw God use you to bless our family, and to do amazing things because you trusted in God's word. And she said, this year, you're not leaving me behind. I'm occupying with you. And so we're really trusting God for some huge, huge things uh, in our family. We're saying in this year of Jubilee, which is what it is for our nation. By the way, do you know that every seventh year in Israel was a year of rest? What year is this for Mavuno? This is our seventh year as a church. And we're saying, we've worked hard, Lord. This is a year of rest for us. This is a year when we begin to enjoy our Sabbath rest. And we see you bless us as a people and increase our influence. But in addition to that, it's the 50th year of our nation's history. And we're saying, surely, yes, you may not be getting this thing. But you know what? This is a place where you exercise faith and you say, I'm stepping in and I'm trusting God. And this is a year when I'm trusting God that many of you, God will help you occupy in your career. God will help you occupy in your families. God will help you occupy nationally. But you know what? Your pastor can't occupy for you. Okay, this wasn't the sermon for the day, and I can see you're not ready for that one. So let's, let's move to something else. But I just want to make sure that nobody gets left behind with this, because I really trust God uh, that this is an amazing year. We must take those risks. We must step out in faith. We must grow in our faith, uh, because I believe God has some great, amazing things for us. But anyway, let's move on to something a little uh, less heavy. Let's talk about food. Food's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, we have an amazing diversity of foods in this nation. Some incredible, incredible food. I don't know if you're sitting next to somebody who's from Kenya. Maybe you're not. Uh, if you are, this is even better for you as you answer this food question. What's your favorite Kenyan food and how do you like it prepared? Uh, come on, this is a great question. I think every one of us, if your neighbor doesn't have an answer to that question, just pray for them right now because surely they're not enjoying the life God created them for. What's your favorite Kenyan food? And if your neighbor is not from this country, help them understand what they're missing. And how do you like it prepared? Fish. 
if I'm going to send Pastor Kure to just go around, Pastor David, if just go around and uh, as usual, just sample a few answers here. Because you might inspire somebody for what they need to get uh, for dinner this evening. But look for somebody who looks like they enjoy good food. Uh, okay. Like they, they have good tastes when it comes to food. All right. And let's just hear what they think. Okay, uh, let's, let's find someone. Um, I've seen a couple of ladies really enjoying the conversation. So we'll start with them. Tell us what your favorite African, the African or Kenyan meal is. They're probably sharing recipes right now. <laughs> Tell us your name and what, that, what it is and how you like it prepared. Good morning, Mavuna. Morning. My name is Caroline Tande, and I like uh, Mokimo. Then we... <laughs> Sprinkled with some oil and uh, onions. There's some little gravy on it. And a little gravy on it. You know, yeah. she, she even has the hand actions to go with it. You can't just say that without some activity. I mean, that's... You can okay. see that starting. Okay, let's move to the middle on this all right, side. All right, all right. Anyone on this side? I want to find someone on this side. Okay, someone here is being pointed at at the very back. All right. Mr. Kari, if you mind just standing up and then telling us yours. Uh, good morning, church. My name is Cairo. Um, Chapati with some nice uh, thick uh, stew and a lot of vegetables. Wow. Chapati. Praise God for chapati. I tell you. Hey, you know, when God created things, I think he took special time with that meal called chapatis. All right, let's come to the middle of the you, I'm going straight to the food court. This is what I, I feel like doing. All right. Okay, I found a gentleman here, a couple of gentlemen who are having a very animated conversation. Would you mind standing and just telling us what yours is? Tell us your name and what it is that your favorite Kenyan meal is. Uh, good morning, Mavuno. Morning. My name is Francis. And I was sharing with my neighbor and my other neighbor here also stepped in. Uh, mine is actually Mokimo, the green one with a few potatoes in there and uh, fried onions. Wow. I think you and Carol have something in common there. Yeah. We'll do a little cook out there. Yeah, we'll meet up together. Right? <laughs> All right. Anybody with a different perspective on food? Okay, there's a gentleman over there who is very keen Let's to share his... So let's see, we have a couple of Mokimos for I'm getting some today. feedback from the audience. All right, all right. Please stand and tell us what yours is. Good morning, Mavuno. Hey, shh. You can see the food has done you good. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Flavor. Uh, the voice is fed by nothing else than a proper sembe. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> then uh, a properly cooked dry fry with kitungu and dania. And some freshly cut skumawiki. Nothing this Wow, 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 wow. Just if I could get a voice like that from eating that kind of meal, sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. Well, I mean, it's amazing because there's some incredible. I, I'm surprised nobody said to Mukiza. You know, Kenyans have some very amazing, uh, amazing dishes. Uh, but you know, I, I just think that Kenyans, we are blessed. You know, I, I, I kind of think of all the foods that we have in this country. And the amazing thing is you don't even have to choose one. Uh, you can eat different kinds of food, and they're all Kenyan. In fact, you can eat all Kenyan all the time, and you'll eat such amazing variety. We don't even need food from outside just to enjoy a full culinary experience. What are we talking about food? Well, we're talking about Kenya. And this whole month, we're going through a series about this nation. Uh, it's called One Prayer. For our visitors who have not been part of this, we've actually been going through a prayer that was written in 1963 when this nation became independent, uh, our national anthem. And it was designed as a prayer so that every time it was said, every time it was sung, every time it was prayed, that it would be speaking blessing over this nation. And so as, as we've been going through an amazing time as a nation, a historic time as a nation, as we face our first uh, uh, elections under a new constitution, as we jump into our 50th year as a nation, we went through, we decided to go through this song, uh, this song that was written as a prayer, and understand what does it mean for this nation. I want to say this, if you're Kenyan, wow, this is your prayer. It's so exciting that you can begin to understand what it is that you sing every time you sing it. If you're not Kenyan, you are adopted in this country for now. We believe you're not here by coincidence. This is your home for now. And we believe that this prayer has something for you as well. We believe that this is our prayer together. And so we went through the first, uh, the first key to enjoying blessing in this nation is to anticipate blessing. Uh, we say that from the first line of the National Anthem that says, O Lord of all creation, bless this our land and nation. And we said we must learn to anticipate blessing. We must learn to appreciate what God has done for this nation. We can't expect him to bless our nation and say bless this our land and nation and every time we open our mouths we're saying something negative. We're cursing. Uh, we're undoing 
our prayer. And we said we must learn to anticipate blessing. I've received so much good feedback uh, from many of you, especially many who are in diaspora. By the way, Kenyans who are in diaspora are so glad for that song, Come Back Home. I hope there are many watching this uh, from wherever they are. Come back home. Build this nation. I think there's too much out there that is negative, that doesn't actually tell you the reality of what God is doing. Other people in the world have seen the opportunities here. It's time for you to be here as well to build our nation. Second thing we talked about last week is this, the second line of our nation anthem is what? Justice, be our shield and defender. And we say that the second key to enjoying blessing in this land is to seek justice. We must seek equity. And, and justice in this land. We must seek to not wait for the government, not wait for NGOs and others to bring about equity, to bring about the pulling up of others, that we must be involved as God's people if we want to see this happen. And God has given us the authority and the opportunity to do so as we jump into this year. Today we want to move into a third one. And I want to say this, every time I've shared, every, every one of those sermons, I've given you some history. How many people like history like me? You know, I love history, and if you have DSTV in your house, I'll come visit just so I can watch History Channel. Uh, clearly, I don't have it, but I'll come to your house to see it. And I, I've given you two versions of Kenya's history. First one starting in 1963, officially, when we became uh, an independent uh, republic. Uh, then last week, we said, you know, it even went further back. Uh, 1895, we were colonized by the British. First time that we actually uh, became uh, a unit. Uh, we started being referred to as a unit. We were a group of nations before that. But I want to even go much farther back today. And I want to go back 4,000 years. Because the first people who lived here, the original Kenyans, the native Kenyans, actually lived here 4,000 years ago. They were related to the Khoi Khoi. Anybody know who the Khoi Khoi are? Oh, you guys know that. Uh, the, 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 the San, the people in, right now they're found where? Mostly in the southern part of Africa. Uh, those, are the kind, those are the people who lived, the, uh, the, the, the people who are the, 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 the real Kenyans. They lived here, they were hunter-gatherers. Uh, and so they're the people who actually lived in this place. They didn't do any farming, they didn't do any, uh, they just hunted and they gathered. And then about 3,000 years, 1,000 years later, they were absorbed and they were pushed out, and that's why you don't find them here, by a group called the Eastern, actually no, I think they are called the Southern Kushites. And they came and they pushed them out and they absorbed them. And that's, that became the people then who are here. And these people brought agriculture to this part of the world. They were the first people who did irrigation, they did composting, and they actually planted crops uh, in addition to some of the things the hunters and gatherers they found here doing. Any people here from the El Molo uh, uh, ethnic group? Let me see, any El Molos in the house? Any Ndorobo in the house? I thought not. These are very, very tiny, tiny groups uh, in our nation. Uh, and yet these are some of the original groups and they, they descend from this mix that was happening 3,000 years ago. Everybody else is a visitor to this country. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, Jambo, Kenya. <laughs> Karibu. <laughs> You're a visitor. It's true. You're a visitor. You are welcomed here, or maybe you aren't. You just came by force. But you're not an original inhabitant of this country. Well, about a thousand years later, these groups were actually pushed to the south because three big invasions came in. Three much larger groups came into this country. And some of you did history. You got A, so you even know this better than I do. Uh, the first one was called the Bantu. They came from the western, uh, uh, western Africa, northern Africa uh, part, and they came down through the, the, the Niger Delta and the Congo Delta, and eventually followed into East Africa, went all the way to South Africa. The ones who settled here, the one, some went to the west, and they became the Kisi and the Luya. Some went to the center, they became the Kamba, the Ameru, the Embu, the Kikuyu, and other groups. And then some went to the east, and they became the Waswahili, the Mijikenda. Many of those intermarried with Arabic groups there, and they settled down in the coastal region. So the first group was a Bantu. The second group came along the river Nile, directly north. And were called Nilots. This is why the word Nilots comes from. The Nile, people from the Nile. And they came down and there were three groups. Okay, let's see who actually did history or the ones who were actually paying attention uh, in class. The first group is called River Lake Nilots. Thank you very much. And the River Lake Nilots went down to the, towards Lake Victoria. Those became the Luo today. And then the center part was the... Highlands Nilots, and those became the people like the Kalenjin, the many, many groups that consist of that. Uh, they were farmers mostly. And then the last group was the? 
The planes are, oh, somebody got an A in school. Hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, the Maasai and the Samburu and other gr- and Dille and other groups. And? And the Teso. Is there a Teso in the house? Oh, yes, clearly. Somebody is saying we were there. Uh, those are the ones then who, uh, and most of them were pastoralists and those communities as well. And then from the uh, northeast came the eastern Kushites. And those were people who came, especially from uh, Somalia and Ethiopia present day. They came down, most of them also pastoralists. They settled down in the northern, mostly arid parts of our, our country today. And they are people like the Somali and the Orma and the Borana. Hey, I can see some of you actually did this stuff. Where are the rest of you? All right, let's not even go there. God still helped you and you're here today. Amen? Uh, even though you are not paying attention in school, clearly. Uh, so, so these groups. So we're talking about a thousand years ago. This is a mix that was happening around this part of the world. If you came in, this is what you'd have found happening. And then around that time, the, uh, uh, the Arabs were beginning to settle down in the coast as well, mostly from the, play, uh, the country called Oman. And they were settling down, doing some intermarriage as well. They were settling down in that part of the world. And so these are the groups that you would have found Uh, in this part of the world had you chosen to come maybe in a space capsule and landed uh, in East Africa this is what you'd have found happening and then about 500 years ago the first Europeans showed up late to the party led by the very very fearless seafaring man known as Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese sailor. And he's the one who came to the coast, led the Portuguese. And about 500 years ago, they began to settle uh, and to, to do trade along that coastal region. And then a, a bit later, the Germans and the Europeans came. Actually, several hundred years later, they came as well. And we talked about how in 1895, the British declared this after the Berlin Conference, a protectorate uh, of, of England. And as a result, uh, many settlers from Europe, from England particularly, came and settled in the, in the highlands and they displaced some of the people there. Another displacement took place as well at that time. So you can see we are a history of displacement, isn't it? Uh, so another displacement took place and they, they kicked out many of the, the groups that were in the fertile areas, uh, mostly f- they were mostly from aristocratic families. They settled down and then they decided to do something very crazy. They decided to build a railway all the way from Mombasa to Uganda and they brought 32,000 Indians. So these are the only ones who were brought here, not voluntarily. Everybody else came by themselves. But these ones were actually shipped here by the British to build the railroad. And many of them ended up staying after that. And they are the ones who uh, became traders and merchants after the railroad was finished. And I really thank God for them. Because if not for them, we would not have chapatis. Praise God for the Indians. (laughs) I really thank God for them. Seriously. Otherwise, we'll be talking about what? I mean, everything else is dry without chapati. You need something to oil, uh, to, to complement. And you know what? I've just given you a beautiful history. This is a history of the ethnic diversity that we have in this country. We have an amazing mix of cultures, which is what creates the beauty of our country. I, I remember when I've, I've lived in countries where they're very monocultural. And when I try to explain to them uh, what... Africa is like. Africa is one of the most diverse places in the world. Uh, About a quarter of the world's spoken languages are actually in this continent. And I say, you know, we live in a place where there's, even in our own country, our small country, there are so many different cultures, languages, history, tradition, and they don't get that. They say, oh, okay, so you're from Africa. I've got a friend in Liberia. I'm like, there are probably six, there are probably 6,000 tribes between that person and me by the time you get to me. Uh, but you know, it's just hard for people to understand. We live in a beautifully, ethnically diverse nation. But as I said last week, as we began to say last week, because of real and perceived injustices, there have been divisions that have come up between the ethnic groups in this nation. And sometimes these divisions have been taken advantage of, especially by political leaders who are looking to secure a voting block. And as a result, they fund the, the divisions into animosities and sometimes even into hostilities. And the result, sometimes, the fruit of that, uh, we can see happening, especially as happened in this country five years ago, the post-election violence, best example of the kind of fruit of what the selfishness of political leaders has resulted in, in fanning the differences between people here. Today we have an incredibly divided nation. We have a nation where even when you read the papers, it seems all the journalists have just concluded, we're hopeless, we're helpless. I remember reading today's paper and one journalist said, all the Kikuyus are voting as a person for TNA, for Uhuru Kenyatta. I said, why? 
have you concluded that? I said, I don't feel represented in that statement. But somehow this person has concluded. And our journalists have concluded. We are completely lost. We are completely bound into these ethnic cocoons that have been created by our political leaders. When you find yourself in that place as a Kenyan, sometimes you feel helpless. You find, what, what can I do? It seems that our country is moving from bad to worse. It almost felt like one day this would end, but it has not ended. In fact, it seems to be getting even more entrenched. What hope is there for this country, this beautiful country, that one day these tribes, these groups, would actually stop being divided and actually become united? What place can I play as an individual? Now, I want to say this. I thank God because his word has solutions for us. And if there's anything I, I want you to understand from this pulpit, that God's word has solutions for every human situation. I want us to turn today to Acts chapter 6. Because there's an amazing story there that I believe gives us God's solution to this nation. But not just to this nation, but to every other nation. Because all nations have uh, need to think about issues that are in this passage. Acts chapter 6 verse 1 to 7 I'm going to be exploring the third line of our national prayer. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. And I'm going to be, I'm, I'm entitling this message, Choose Unity. Choose Unity. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. You know, if I was that baby, I'd be crying as well when I think about the issues in this nation sometimes. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the peoples, all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn over this responsibility to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Procurus, Nicana, Timon, Pomenus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I pray, Father, as, as we look at your word today, Lord, let your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We invite you now to come and speak to us, your children, as we gather together to reflect on, on important things pertaining to this nation that we are all a part of. This nation we are a part of because we are born in it or because we are adopted in it or because we are visiting it. This nation that we love. And so we ask that, Father, you would allow your word to come and to speak to us. I pray that, Father, any, any force, any thought here that is raised up against Jesus Christ, any thought that resists your purpose, Lord, we speak over it right now and we say it is bound in the name of Jesus. Anything that would keep your word from bearing fruit in our lives, we resist it and we cast it to the place that you've prepared for it. And we invite you now, Lord, come. I pray that you would use me and that my, 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 my speaking will be pleasing to you and that you would speak to every one of us our listening will be pleasing to you as well for we ask this in your precious name and God's people said amen early church was in an exciting exciting stage of its history they were seeing growth like they'd never seen before the potential was amazing God was doing such incredible things among them God was doing such things with great promise they were on the verge of even greater things but underlying, underneath the surface of this wonderful fellowship of people, there were divisions. There were things that threatened to tear this young fellowship apart. You know, they had a distribution, a food distribution program that looked after the poor. And what happened is a group of the poor were feeling alienated, were feeling discriminated against by the church. You see, they felt that the widows that came from the Grecian group were being treated differently because they were not from the group that was related to the apostles. They felt that the leaders of the fellowship, the leaders of the community, were of a different group, and because of that, their people were being maligned. And so they raised this complaint. They said, something must be done because we feel we're being treated unfairly. Now, the interesting thing about this, you need to note, is Hebraic Jews were 
Jews who had grown up in Palestine. They, they spoke the language. They spoke Aramaic like Jesus. And so they understood the words of Jesus directly without any translation. They had lived in a place where the law was followed to the letter. They held fast to the ceremonial laws of the Jews. And because of that, they were considered pure Jews. The Grecian Jews, however, were people from diaspora. They had sort of lived out and grown out, some of them for generations, in other parts of the world. And now had relocated back to this place called Palestine. Many of them, because of the, 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 the mix of cultures, had come back. They didn't hold, back to, uh, hold fast to the same laws. They didn't practice the law of Moses as well. And they were looked down on by the pure, the Hebraic Jews. In fact, the two groups just did not get along. Now, we're not told what the, source of the, com- uh, what the evidence for the complaint was. We're not told what, what they gave us their evidence. All we're told is for some reason or the other, they felt slighted. They felt discriminated against because they acted or sounded or looked different from the majority group in the fellowship. Now, I want to say this. It's no fun to be treated differently, to be discriminated against because of something that you have no control over. None of us has any control over where we were born. None of us applied to be born in Western Kenya or in coast or in another country. None of us applied. And it's no fun to be treated differently because of where we come from, because of our son name. I experienced this for the first time as a young student in the United States. It was interesting because you know that country is a country that has had a long history of division between races and have had a long history of seeking to reconcile the different racial groups. I don't know what it was exactly, what evidence I could give that I was treated unfairly or discriminated against. It wasn't something I could point my finger at uh, very concretely. Maybe it was that when I walked in a shop, into a shop, that the shopping attendant would follow me like they were expecting me to shoplift at any moment. And they just needed to be there to make sure. And they'd ask, can I help you, sir? And I'd say, uh, you asked me that last time, and I said no. Uh, if I need your help, I'll call you. Well, I wouldn't say that because I'd be intimidated to say that. But I'd think, you're not following around that other guy. Why are you following me? Maybe it was the way they raised their voice to speak loudly in case I didn't understand or missed a word. Or slowly, just to make sure that I wasn't left behind. And then when I, resp- I replied in English, they said, Oh, you speak such good English. Where did you learn? And I wanted to say, the same place you did. We were colonized by the British. Weren't you also colonized? <laughs> we learned it together. But you know, I couldn't say that. Maybe it was the way somehow my jokes weren't laughed at as loudly as my friends who are from there. I, for some reason, I just really felt this wasn't my home. And... I sympathized and empathized with African Americans because for many, many times I thought at least I have a home to go to where I don't face that every day where I don't get discriminated by the color of my skin I have a home where everybody looks like me and nobody notices when I walk in oh, a black person has walked in nobody thinks like that where I come from I, I used to feel good and I felt sorry for my African American friends but I remember I had a Kenyan friend who really was irritated by African Americans and he said, all oh, these people complain and complain all the time. They, I don't even know what their big deal is. If my children grew up in that country, they would thrive. They wouldn't even be talking about who cares what people say to you. You just do your business and you succeed. And I remember my friend came to visit. And this was after 9-11. Uh, and there was a lot of security precautions in the airports. And unfortunately, he and I had to do about nine different airports uh, because we were doing a series of conferences and different thing- speaking things. And so we, at, the, at the first airport, uh, we went in. And as we were going through the security check uh, to enter the terminal, uh, the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you have been randomly picked by the computer uh, for a thorough check. So we were pulled aside into a room and we were given the thorough check. I'm telling you nothing very pleasant. Uh, and we finally got out of the, the, the random check and we went to the counter. And as we were going through the, uh, in the counter, the lady said, Oh, so, sorry, sirs, uh, just to let you know, you, you, you've been randomly picked by the computer for your bags to go through a thorough check. And so again, the randomness of this was amazing. Uh, we took our bags and they searched them. You know those ones where they put all those chemicals and things in them and they remove everything. You know, sometimes you're wishing, oh dear, I wish I 
packed those things nicely. They were all removed and they checked them. And then after that, just before we entered the plane, uh, they said, oh, sorry, sir. The stewardess says, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you've just been randomly picked uh, for a check before you get on the plane. Well, we wrote it off. But after it had happened on the fourth plane, and I'm telling you, I kid you not, it happened almost five different times. And on this particular one, there were about 50 people on the plane, and they pulled out five of us for random checks just before we got on the plane. Two of us were Africans, three of them had Arabic names. <laughs> By that time, my good friend who had had no st stake with his African, he, he, you know what you're saying? You're saying, is it because you're black? What's wrong with these people? Why are they picking on us? I said, oh my goodness, stop being so angry. And it was so interesting because I realized he was speaking, I mean, the same things he'd said he'd never be worried about if his children grew up there. He was acting in exactly the same way. He had finally understood what it means to be treated differently because you come from somewhere else, because of something you can't control. Clearly, ethnic discrimination, aka tribalism, aka negative ethnicity, was not created in Africa. Not even in Kenya. We're not the ones who have a stake on this thing only. Ethnic tensions are found worldwide between African Americans and Caucasian Americans, the Irish and the English, the Serbs and the Bosnians, white and black South Amer Africans, North and Southern Sudanese, Eritreans and Ethiopians, Tutsis and Hutus, across the world. This thing doesn't belong to any nation. It's found everywhere where they're human beings. You know, it's natural and it's easy and it's a, the first thing we do is gravitate to people who are like us, who speak like us, who sound like us, who look like us. That's the first natural thing. And it's a good thing to celebrate our culture. But the problem is when we begin to think of our culture as superior to others, when we look down on another culture, or maybe we're intimidated by another culture and we look up to another culture and treat people differently, because of something they have no control over. Our song said something powerful. It says, may we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. In his book, Negative Ethnicity, former Sukukia MP Koigu Oamere says that the seeds of negative ethnicity are planted with such innocence in harmless jokes that people share whenever they are together with people who are like them. Harmless, at least it seems that way. I mean, you've all had the stereotype that kikus are all thieves. And the only way to tell if a kiku is really dead is to drop a coin as they lie on the road. And I tell you, if that guy is, is not dead, you just uh, you wake up and reach out for your coin. You've had that one. <laughs> and you know, I must say something. I actually think that one's really funny. <laughs> it's really, really funny. Uh, and I think someone should try that one on me and see if I'm really alive or dead. Costarians are said to be lazy. Lawyers are said to make good housemaids. Masais is another word in this country for watchmen. Luos are said to like throwing stones. Asians are supposed to be stingy and harsh. Have you had any of these stereotypes? Yes. Yes. We comedians have made a lifestyle making fun of these things that are supposed to be obvious that you can see them as obvious. But what Koigi's book shows, and by the way, it's so interesting, it's, these things are funny until somebody says something about your group. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're like, that wasn't funny. I don't even know. In fact, there's somebody here who's think, somebody here has checked out. They're like, I don't believe pastor just said that about my people. It's like, it stops being funny when it's about, when you're on the, the one on the spotlight, it stops being funny. And what Koigi says is that these stereotypes, these harmless jokes, they easily just build walls between communities. And eventually what ends up happening is that these walls can be fanned into flame, like we saw happening here in the post-election violence, or has happened to Rwanda uh, during the, 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 the massacre uh, as, a two, uh, as a two groups, dominant groups, uh, engaged in warfare a few years ago. The first thing to note in scripture is that the apostles took the complaint seriously. It's amazing how seriously they took this. On hearing this complaint, it's a complaint about the poor, about a group of widows in the church. They called together a meeting of the whole fellowship. 
I mean, that sounds excessive. This was a big group. This is one of the first few times, in fact, one of the few times you ever hear of the whole church being called together. And they called them because of a complaint by a small group that was feeling marginalized. The apostles didn't say, you know what, this issue is, it's a small issue. Send someone to deal with it. They didn't say, ah, don't worry, in the next generation, after all our children are intermarried, this thing will stop being an issue in our, in our church. They didn't even say something like, you know what, there must be some reason. Have you considered that the Grecian Jews must have something about them? That could be making other people discriminate. They didn't answer with defensiveness. They didn't answer with trying to explain the issue. They took it seriously. And they engaged to understand the perspective from the, the, the eyes of the Grecian Jews. In other words, they, they did, to use an old American uh, proverb, they walked a mile in their neighbor's shoes. Now, to walk a mile in your neighbor's shoes, <laughs> what it really means is to choose to understand reality from their point of view. Not to try and explain it from your perspective, but to enter their perspective and to say, why do they act the way they do? Many times when we do that, we realize, oh my goodness, I'll be no different if I was in that situation. I remember the first time this happened for me was <laughs> in a very stark way. It was during the post-election violence. And one of the untold stories, by the way, of the post-election violence is that the church really organized and did some amazing things. This is a story you're probably not going to see published or written. Uh, but the church, I, I remember what happened is a group of about 200 uh, church leaders got together and decided to take time. We, we actually took time off. I, I was away from Mavuno for two months. I told Mavuno, release me because this is national duty. And many pastors did the same. And for two months, we planned this, we fundraised, we got resources together. And then we went out into the, all the, tra the, the major troubled hotspots where there, were, there was division and there was fighting. And we went in. And what we would do is we would go into a town. We started in Mombasa, ended in Kisumu. We'd go into a town for the first day. We'd call all the pastors in that town together. Because if you remember, even the churches were divided. This thing, this thing was so deep, it didn't matter where you're from. If you're from that group, you belong there. Towns were divided. And we called all the pastors from across the different divides and different denominations. And we would spend a day talking about what the Bible says about reconciliation, demonstrating reconciliation, sharing openly about the pain that people had experienced. And what happened at every one of those times, God checked in. And there, was, there were tears, there was a, a forgiveness, there was release. Some of you remember, do you remember the church that was burnt in Eldoret? And I remember the pastors from that church sitting down and telling us their story. One of them had been injured. They were sitting and telling us their story. And in the middle of that, one pastor, a bishop from the community uh, that had been, was, was accused of having perpetrated this, came up with a basin. And he put it down at the feet of those pastors. And he washed their feet and he cried and said, forgive us. Forgive us for what we did. This is a whole bishop. And I tell you, there was no dry eye in the room. I tell you, it was such, we all wept. And what would happen the next day after God's people had connected and said we are one, we'd go out the next day and we'd have a public rally and call all the believers in a town, all the Christians, and we would say, your pastors are one. You cannot be otherwise. And every town we left, I can tell you, I kid you not, every town we left, we never had a single instance. And the church kept tabs of another act of violence because of post-election violence. I really believe the church played a huge role in bringing this nation. As Kofi Annan and all the other delegates were shuttling out there, things were happening in the background. Well, my personal experience, the biggest one, was in Kisumu. And I remember in Kisumu that again the same thing happened. Kisumu predominantly Luo community. I'm from the Kikuyu community. And as the pastors began to share, as they began to share their pain, I began to hear things I'd never heard. I began to hear the pain of those, uh, of those Luo leaders, those Luo pastors, for their community. They talked about how they had been alienated by the Kenyatta government. They talked about how they had been sidelined by the Moi government. They cried about the poverty of their people. In that meeting, I began to remember what I'd seen as I drove into that place. I realized I'd witnessed poverty and asked, how come this place is so poor? And I began to realize it was deliberate government action that had led to the sidelining of a whole people. I began to see their tears as they cried for all the prominent lower leaders who had been assassinated because of government action. People like Tom Boyer, Robert Oko and others. 
And at, and at that point, I began to even hear statistics that shocked me. I began to realize that the life expectancy in Nyanza is 19 years different from central Kenya. In other words, people die on average 19 years earlier than where I come from, where I am descended from, because I don't consider myself, I consider myself from this part. But I began to listen to this, and my heart broke. And I said, I never knew that. I never understood that. And I began to realize that my ignorance had made me a part of the problem. I began to confess and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me because I've not played a part in walking with my brothers, in standing alongside for justice in this nation. And I began to realize, I, you know, I'd grown, I grew up in the city like some of you. I went to primary schools that were very integrated with people from different uh, ethnicities and races. And I always said, I'm not a tribalist. Uh, look at all the people around me. I realized, oh my goodness, I had the seeds in my heart. Because by not doing anything, I was doing something to perpetuate the status quo. And I said, Lord, thank you for helping me walk a mile in my neighbor's shoes. I want to tell you this. The last five years have been completely different in my understanding of Kenyan reality. I find myself often, even in my own family meetings, I find myself on a completely different side of an issue. Because I understood certain realities about this country. Because I took the time, by God's grace, to walk in my neighbor's shoes. What does it mean when we begin to enter into one another's situation? Walk into our neighbor's shoes. You see, like my Kenyan friend in America, I might have laughed at him then. I realized I was no different. I was no different. In my ignorance, I had said, you know, I don't understand. Why do these people act this way? You know, I began to realize something. In fact, one of the biggest realizations for me from that meeting in Kisumu, I said, if I had been in that same situation as those young men in Kibera, I would have led the rebellion to pull out those railway my, myself. I want to say that. I would have actually done it. Not, by God's grace, I thank God that I know him. And I'm a believer. Maybe that would have checked me. But you know what? I understood why they did what they did. For the first time. Before that, I'd just been full of condemnation. How dare? Why? And I realized, oh my goodness, this is a fruit of injustice. A whole national injustice. You know, much of our stereotyping of others comes because we fail to understand reality from their perspective. We judge them from our position rather than entering their position to understand their reality. Lack of understanding generates fear, suspicion, and consequently negative uh, assessment of our people and their cultural values. We must make a commitment, therefore, to listen and to understand. This is why the song says, may we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty, listen to me, unity is a choice. It's a choice. You can't just sing that song and then say, those people. Unity is a choice. The second thing, the second thing that the apostles did, <laughs> they didn't just understand, because understanding is only one step. There's another step that you have to take, and that was to give preference. To give preference. Now, this is the most radical thing. A careful reading of the passage will show you something amazing. The names that are written there, you might notice if you read them, if you've been reading through the Bible and you come to Acts chapter 6, you, you will notice something very unusual. You will realize none of these names have I read before in the scripture. None of these names were names that were there in Exodus and Deuteronomy, etc. I mean, names like Philip, Procurus, Nicona, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, they weren't Hebraic names. They were all Grecian names. They were all Greek names. Something radical happened in the fellowship. What the apostles did is they said, we realize, now that we've walked a mile in your shoes, we realize why you feel the way you feel. I mean, look at us. All the leaders of the church are from one group. We're all from the same background. No wonder we don't understand your pain. So, choose... And when the church chose, they chose seven. And they said, choose these men and let's bring them into the fellowship, into the leadership. And then they said, we will actually give them full authority over the distribution of the food. So not only are they going to distribute for the Greeks, they will distribute for the Hebrews as well. And they said, that's the solution. They gave preference. Isn't that a radical thing? They said, look, we're not even going to give them, you know, most people would have said, okay, let's do this. Let's split the resources. How many Grecian widows? Let's give, make sure those guys receive. Get some Greek leaders. You guys give your people. Uh, how many Hebrews are here? Let's get some people. Let's do some majimbo in the church. Let's separate everybody out. Let's make sure everybody gets their peace. But they said, no. 
we are stronger together. And so they said, we're going to actually get that group that is feeling maligned to be the ones in charge of food responsibility. After that, nobody can complain because it's the people who are responsible. It's not a radical thing. Guess what it did for the fellowship? Huge credibility. Nobody could point fingers at anybody else. In fact, the Bible says everybody found this to be pleasing. And the next thing that happens, radical thing. The fellowship grew exponentially. And it tells us that even Jewish priests, the hardest people to reach, even Jewish priests were added to the faith. As in people looked and they said, you know what? I've been going to the temple all my life. I've been serving there. I've never seen anything like this. This is so radical that God has to be there. Count me in. This is the power of unity. This is why the song says what? May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. We are stronger together. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility consider others better. <laughs> what do they say? Consider others better than yourself. You know, I would think a really reasonable thing would be to say, in humility, consider others the same as yourself. <laughs> is that, I mean, that's reasonable, isn't it? I mean, consider the person at least equal to you. That sounds reasonable. How do you ask me to consider them better? But you know what Paul knows? He recognizes that it's impossible for you to look down on somebody if you consider them your better. It's impossible for you to fight somebody or to be deceived. When you consider somebody your better, what happens? You want to be around them, isn't it? You want to receive from them because they have something you need. So he says, in humility, consider others better than yourself. Negative ethnicity is an attitude of superiority towards others. But it's very difficult to disrespect or look down to somebody that you admire. So what if? What if we could learn to admire and, and aspire to, to, to enjoy the qualities of those other groups that are around us in this nation. What if we could decide, let's celebrate, let's enjoy, let's respect, let's admire, let's sing about, let's look for, let's acquire the gifts that others bring to the table. What if we could learn from the Luo culture how to have a sense of justice and a value for education? Because that's what Luo's do have. The culture has that, isn't it? I mean, let me tell you something. I began to understand, if you've gone through injustice for so long, you get a deeply ingrained sense of justice. And I say, if all of us had the sense of justice that the lower community has, this nation would be a different place. It would. There are too many of us who say, you know what, let's just, ha let's just have peace at any cost. Let's just leave things the way they are. But you know what, if you've gone through that kind of injustice, you say, forget this. This nation will only move forward if there's justice. What if we could celebrate and all of us say, I want to learn from this group how to have a value for justice. It's a godly and a biblical thing. What if we could learn from the Luya culture how to be loyal and have a strong work ethic? Ah, any, anybody know any Luya friends who have a serious work ethic? Let me tell you what, the Luya people have an amazing work ethic. What if the rest of us could say, you know what, I want to learn that. If we could have that in our nation, this nation would be unstoppable. Nothing would keep us back. What if we could learn from the Asian culture how to work together as families and to be industrious? Isn't that a beautiful thing? You know, many of us are so divided, the, the, the business goes up in one generation, it splits everything because everybody goes their separate ways. What if we could say to the Asian culture, teach the rest of us? Because if you teach us this value, this nation will be everything God is calling it to be. What if we could learn from the people of the coast how to enjoy life and not take ourselves too seriously? <laughs> I mean, for real. Some of you guys take yourself so seriously, you're already getting heart attacks in your early 40s. Or late 30s. I, I think that many of us would have a much happier life if we could just learn some of that easy, relaxed lifestyle that says, you know what, let's take time for people. Let's take time for relationships. And those things actually matter. We would be so blessed if we could learn that from the coast culture. What if we could learn from the Kamba culture how to be spiritually sensitive? It's true. Let me tell you something. Cows just have a certain wavelength. I can say that because one of my best friends is Pastor Simon. I mean, there's just a certain thing that they have. And I think it comes from just a background of being so tuned to the spiritual world. And we could learn a lot as Kenyans, and especially as believers, in our faith about this from the Kamba culture. What if we could learn from the Kikuyu culture how to be entrepreneurial? It's true. And what if we could learn from the Maasai culture how to be fearless? 
never put up our hand. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And to value our culture. One thing I really admire about the Maasai culture is they value their culture. They know where they came from. And they say, if you don't know where you came from, you'll never know where you're going. You become a slave of others. And I love the fact that they value their culture these years. They can teach us as a nation how to value our story and to value our culture. You know, I've not even mentioned every group here. And please don't stone me if I haven't mentioned your group yet. The reason is because we'll be here till tomorrow. There are such amazing uh, gifts uh, in every group. And that's what I'm really saying. Every group has something wonderful to give us as a nation. If we could just see them as esteemed and begin to say, what can we learn? What can we get from each other? We are stronger together. So let me ask you a couple of questions at this point. Please take note of these questions and maybe answer them for yourself. First question, who are your three closest friends? Three closest friends. Come on, just answer that question. Who are your three closest friends? Put your names, their names in your mind right now. What ethnicity are they from? Are they the same as you? Okay. Second question, this one maybe goes a little deeper than friends. How many of your investment club members are from a different ethnicity? Somehow when it comes to money, I think we like people we trust. So how many of you are from a group where, you know what, my group members are all, almost 80% are from the same ethnicity. Of the people that you've employed or given work to in the last 12 months, including in your home, how many are from the ethnicity that you trust? The ethnicity, either your own ethnicity or the ethnicity you feel is safe to work from. How many are from that ethnicity? When, did, when was the last time you ate in the home of a friend from a different ethnicity, religion, nationality, or race? When was the last time you, you shared table fellowship with somebody different from yourself? Because there's something powerful about sharing meals with one another, with our closest friends. And then here's one last one which is particularly pertinent to us Kenyans at this time in our history. Who is the obviously correct presidential choice for you. you know, it was so interesting when I listened to the debate, the presidential debate. A few people came, I, I talked to people and they saying, I'm so glad. It was so obvious. One person stood head and shoulders above everybody else. It was so clear. And I asked this one, they say, Mudabadi, obviously. This one, but it was right, obviously. But of course, you know, it was, it was, I mean, it was so interesting that depending on where you come from, <laughs> You are filtering the debate. I don't know. Somehow two of you are watching the same television. <laughs> but somehow the, the, the process that you're receiving is completely different. And you're coming out saying it was so obvious. You're saying the same thing, but you mean something completely different. Are, is that person who is your obvious presidential candidate that you're planning to vote for, are they from your ethnicity? Are they from your ethnicity? And do you have a better reason to vote for them than they will protect the interests of your people? This song says, may we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Do you ever notice that it's only when you have unity that you can have peace as a nation? We learned that in 2007, didn't we? You can't have peace without unity. Also, liberty. Liberty is a freedom to live wherever I want. The freedom to go wherever I want. And we realize without unity, no liberty. There is no liberty. This is why the song says, may we live in unity, peace, and liberty. We're learning from the Bible that unity is a choice. And we must choose two things. Number one, to understand. To understand. What if you could deliberately build real friendships of trust with people from other ethnicities? So that by this year, the end of this year, the people around you will look completely different. I'm not saying dump your friends right now. But I'm saying give some affirmative action. Begin to populate the people around you with people from different ethnicities. You know, it's interesting. Many of us don't actually choose our friends. Do you notice this? Some of our many of our friends are actually chosen because I grew up in this family and so my parents' best friends, because our parents grew up in the village and all their best friends were from this community, so somehow all my best friends growing up just happened to be Kikuyu. I didn't choose that, but somehow that's the case. And what happened is I found in, 20, in 2005 when I asked myself this question, I realized my group around me, my closest group, the ones who I really trusted, I didn't choose them, but they were all from one ethnicity. And I made a decision. I said, by God's grace, by the next election, I'll be in a completely different place. And I deliberately set out to populate my friendships with people I wanted to trust from different ethnicities. And I want to give glory to God. I think God has blessed that. Because today, my best friends 
are from a widely vari different variety from who was around me before. And it's not that I kicked my old friends out, but it's that I began to give preference to people who are different for myself, from myself. What if we, we could seek to also affirm the friendships of those around us? I remember when the post-election violence happened. <laughs> you know, it was so interesting that all of a sudden I'd had friends, I'd never even asked where they came from in the country. But all of a sudden, did any of this happen to any of you? All of a sudden in a conversation you start finding yourself thinking, oops, they're not laughing as loudly as they used to. Somehow you start wondering, are they thinking about where I come from? And it was so good by that time that I had friends that I, that I, I trusted and that I could have real conversations with. Anthony Okoth is here. He's one of my best friends. And he and I had some great conversations during that time. And he was a great encouragement to me. Uh, we could talk about things. Uh, because we, and we were together with Pastor Linda, who is from the Luo community. Pastor Simon from the Kamba community. And many others. And as a result, I was surrounded by people who give, could give perspective to this issue. So number one, we must choose to understand, enter into the world, understand our friends' backgrounds. Number two, give preference. The second choice we must give is give preference. What if you could choose to challenge all your family members and those around you who crack those harmless jokes about other communities? What if you could say, you know what, not on my watch, and start to have some hard conversations. By the way, my family members know you don't make any jokes about other Kenyan communities when I'm there. You can make them if you want to on your own. But when I'm here, I will create ruckus. I will, even when I'm in my in-law's house, I will do the same thing. And people just know, you don't do that when this guy is here. He's no fun. He doesn't laugh. He argues back. What if you chose to do that? What if you chose not to talk in mother tongue when those guys will come and start vibing with you in front of you, other people and shutting out everybody else and you say, Psst, these people don't understand what you're saying. Let's speak a language we all understand. What if we did that? Yeah, in the office. But then some of our offices have become ethnic cocoons. And we shut out deliberately. And it makes people feel left out. Even if there's only one person from another group, say, you know what? They don't understand. I thank God because in my family, uh, my, my, my relatives have married from the Kalenjin community, from the Luo community. So when you have a family meeting, we can't talk in Kikuyu. I find it a lovely thing. It's wonderful. Because even my parents have to find ways to express what they're thinking in Swahili or English. And it makes them also begin to appreciate other communities in this country. What if we could do that? What if when you're faced with two people from the same position, for the same position, two people applying for the same position, equally qualified, what if you could choose to give preference to the one who is different from yourself? It's radical preference. That's saying, you know what? I want diversity in my organization. I want diversity around me. What if we could begin to do that? United we stand. Divided we fall. I believe God is challenging us. The beauty of our nation is its, it's, 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 it's diversity. And I want to live in a country where my children can marry somebody from a different ethnicity and not fear that they'll be called traitors by people from their community. I want to live in a Kenya where you can work and live and do business anywhere you choose. And nobody will cut you off from county funds because your last name is from a different part of this country. This is a country that we must fight for. This is how we live in unity and peace and liberty. And I want to say this as I conclude. While this message is true for all Kenyans, it is critical for Christians. It's non-negotiable for Christians. The Bible tells us, John chapter 13 verse 34, Jesus says, the thing that will distinguish you as, you as Christians is not how well you pray, it's not that you pray in tongues, it's not that you do miracles, it's not that you have crusades, it's not anything else, but your love for one another. This is what Jesus says. He says, by this all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Imagine if people could walk into Mavuno Church and say there's something different here. I've never seen this. There are people from every race, people from every ethnicity, people from every background, and they are best friends. They love each other. This thing that is riveting our nation, this thing that other people are talking about out there, it's not even an issue here because people are actively advocating for one another. What if people could come and see that about us? You know what I believe, Mavuno? This nation would not be reached. People would not come to church because of our beautiful music. I believe it has to be something different. The quality of our lives together. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Come on, let's give glory to God. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. I want to conclude in prayer. Father, we bless you. I want to conclude in prayer. I want to pray for us. 
And I just sense as I speak this word that there are some people here who carry some wounds. That you've been wounded in your office. You've been wounded in your home. But, and for some reason you have just this pain against another ethnicity. By the way, there are even people here who've said, I will never marry from that community. I will never be part of that community. There's something that was done. And I just sense that the Lord is saying, I want to bring healing to this nation. And it begins in my church. I'm going to ask you if you're here to just stand up right now. We want to just conclude. We're going to be concluding in a moment. So please don't run. But I just want to pray for us who are in that position. Just stand wherever you are. You've been hurt in your workplace by another community. And you've said, you know, I'll never work for another Asian. I'll never work for another Kiku. I'll never do this because of pain that has come. The Lord revealed to me there are many of us who are going through that pain. Come on, stand wherever you are. This is when you begin to say, Lord, by your help, I choose to be different. Come on, let's appreciate them as they stand across the room, different places, standing up, saying, Lord, I was hurt, but I want to release today. With your help, I choose to release. There are also some of us who are saying, even as those are standing, but you know what? I understand now from this message. I thought I wasn't tribal, but there's something in me. There are seeds of that as well. I've been part of this thing. And as the Lord is speaking, you're saying, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me because I've not stood up on behalf of others. Forgive me because I've not played my role in building, choosing unity. I'm going to ask you to stand up as well. Because you're coming before the Lord right now and saying, Lord, I choose to be different. Come on, let's appreciate them as they stand. Stand wherever you are. The Lord is speaking to you. And you're saying, you know what? I've, in my family, I've not rebuked people who are speaking like this. I've not stopped people from cracking those jokes. I've not taken the part of the other. I've not chosen to walk in another's shoes. And I'm saying, Lord, help me. Because from today, I choose to do this. Let's appreciate them one more time. By the way, I sense there are many more who the Lord is speaking to right now. Now, I want to challenge you to do this. You're not doing this as any symbol for anybody else. You're doing this because the Father himself is here. You're not doing this for Pastor M. You're doing this because the Father himself is speaking. To God be the glory. Come on, just put out your hands before the Lord right now. And begin to release whatever it is. Say, Father God, I choose to be different. Father God, I thank you for those who are releasing pain right now. For those who are saying, Lord, forgive me. I was so hard that I made decisions about another ethnicity, another group in my pain. And Lord, right now I release that pain. Father God, I pray that as they make that decision, that Lord, you would embrace them. Thank you. People from different communities in this congregation who are saying, Lord, I release. I release that group. And I thank you that, Lord, as they do so, I sense your power is here to cause these to be advocates for unity even where they're coming from. Father, I pray that you just bring great healing, great restoration for those who are praying that prayer right now. I thank you for those who are praying a prayer of confession. I sense that there's some who just need to be saying, Lord, forgive me. I thank you because, Lord, when we bring our sins to you, you do not treat us as our sins deserve. I thank you that, Lord, as we begin to recognize this thing, that we become the Kenyans you're calling us to be and the Christians you're calling us to be. And I pray that, Father God, as these release this issue to you, that, Lord, you would allow your grace to be abundant, abundant for them as well. You would not treat as sin deserves, but instead you would bring restoration to these, our brothers and sisters. We bless your name, Lord. Let me invite all of us to stand up right now in God's presence. As we come to the end of our service, we want to say this national prayer one more time together. This song we sing, we sing not because of just patriotism, because patriotism, patriotism can be a blind thing sometimes. But we sing it because we have been put in this nation for such a time as this. And as a result, we own the prayer for this nation. And we speak it as blessing for this nation, knowing if this nation prospers, we we'll prosper. I want us to sing it. What language do you have it up in? These guys always choose. Sometimes they throw me off. Or oh, you don't have it. Or oh, you do have it. Okay, put it up. Let's, let's see it. Put it on the bow, please. Okay, we're going to sing it in Swahili. I guess today they've decided to sing it in Swahili. So the rest of you who don't know Swahili, you're going to be singing in tongues. But this song says, Bless this land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found, be found within our borders. Let's sing it together.
big shout to the Lord right now. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And so, Lord, I speak blessing over your people as they go out this week. I pray that indeed there will be a difference in your people. Set us apart, Lord, that we will not think like the world thinks. That, Lord, we will be a model and a light for this nation. That they would see what it means to live in unity and peace and liberty. And I pray that, Lord, as we apply this message, that, Father, our families would begin to apply it as well. And that, Father, something would spread across this nation that would unlock peace and liberty and prosperity. I speak blessing over you now, God's people. May the people around you find joy because of you. May those who work for you rejoice because they have been chosen to work for you. May those who you work for rejoice because somebody like you has been placed to work in that company. May your children rejoice in you, in you as a parent. May the wife rejoice because of the husband who is here. May the husband be blessed by the wife who has chosen to apply this message. I speak God's blessing to you as you go out into the week. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory.